Hey, thank you everybody for joining us again. This is another mission talk on Dr. Werner Vogel's CTO keynote. This is Jared Childs, Vice President of Consulting Services, and I have Tim with me here today. Hey, everybody. Tim Banks, uh, consultant here at Mission. We are excited. We're going to have another one of these uh, videos for you. We're going to talk a little bit about our reactions and some of the topics that uh, were covered today, which was really cool. There was a lot of really good themes around reinvention, which has been, of course, what we've seen throughout all of these sessions. If you're interested, please go to the mission blog and you can look back and see some of the previous recordings and we'll probably have more coming of these as well. Um, but yeah, Tim and I are just gonna go back and forth and share some of our thoughts on this. Uh, I, I will say, you know, one thing Tim that I thought was really cool was just the, how he was able to tie reinvention theme into how companies were surviving and being resilient and even serving clients in different ways through the pandemic. That was one of the first big things that came out and then we shifted from there into some of the classic, uh, Werner MO around cloud best practices and what AWS is doing to make those kinds of things easier for developers and operations teams. Um, but let's start off, let's talk about some of the some of the pandemic implications. I mean, what did what did you see that was interesting to you that came out of this session today? Well, I think first and foremost, I think, you know, AWS has been really, you know, beating that reinvention drum. And I really think that, you know, when we consider like everything, when we consider what we thought 2020 was going to be like on January 1, 2020 versus what it is like now on December 15th, 2020, like that reinvention has been so necessary. We've seen, uh, we've seen our own customers among with any, along with many others have to completely change how they do their business, right? Mm -hmm. Completely change how they do uh, how they have their infrastructure, how they have their software deployment, you know, um, change their business models altogether and try to, to be uh, agile and adjusting to these things. So right. talking about reinvention uh, this year and how businesses really do it, I think it's super important, super appropriate, uh, considering all the things that people have had to do. Like there's been so much innovation with tr people trying to reinvent themselves uh, in order to stay afloat here in 2020. One of the things I thought they brought up, they brought up um, a company, Ava, um, which was uh, like a, a women's women's reproductive health company um, that gathered, you know, biometric data to help uh, women, you know, uh, make good data driven decisions on their on their reproductive uh, health care. Um, but they when in the time of COVID, they took that that biometric data. And now they're using it to to detect, uh, you know, early warning signs when someone, someone has COVID. Right. Um, it's interesting because they said in the thing, they classify themselves as a data company, not, not, a, not a, a healthcare or pre reproductive company, but as a data company, right? And so like, what do you do with that data? I thought it was really awesome. Having yeah, there's, having it's really cool seeing, I mean, you know, when you have these types of cloud practices in place, or if you're able to pivot quickly enough into it, where there were a few companies they talked about that did that, not only did it help make some of these companies more resilient, but it gave them that opportunity to pivot quickly with this infrastructure behind them or these options behind them to serve clients differently. And I thought like early detection out of that platform, they already had the sensors available. They had access to data. All they had to do is go relearn some algorithms and things like that in order to help identify those. And it sounds like they're right on the cusp now going through some, some final testing stages yep. where this actually yeah, like a really 20, viable solution. Yeah. Like 20,000 people or something like that. Yeah. And I think it's interesting because, you know, we look at some of the other, some of the other changes that companies had to made, make, because of the current situation of the pandemic, whether they're working from home or whether they, you know, they're, they're, you know, not just working from home, but where their kids are and what the, what the infrastructure that children need in order to be, you know, have daycare or, or get, or get educated. Um, some of the practices that, that, ha that you have to get around because now instead of having, you know, maybe one person, if you were working from home before, one person using up all the bandwidth. Now you got all these people that are, you know, that, you know, someone in online classes, two people working from home and, you know, some other kids that are streaming video just, you know, because they're, because they're too young for classes. Um, that gets all the kinds of spiky traffic. Like how many people, how many people are, are, do you use that did not use Zoom several hours a day before this year are doing it now? They said right. 30 times growth, 30 X the growth that they saw when the pandemic kicked off. I mean, if you just think of like a classic architecture in your own data center, I mean, no one anticipates 30 X growth, right? And so I think yeah. that's really incredible. And the ability to have that scale and pivot the strategy is critical yeah. to their success. Um, oh, absolutely. There were other examples, um, you know, not even necessarily a pandemic oriented, but similar dealing with the spiky traffic. It's a classic cloud use case, but they talk about Lego. Lego was a great example where they talked about these massive spikes in certain times of year when they launched new products. I was particularly interested in the Millennium Falcon launch. That of was course, cool. of course. About that. Well, I think it's, I think, I mean, it's one of those things that are funny. I think that is very topical, the pandemic, because people are home now. 
people are home with their kids mm. and and you know disney's releasing all these this these uh these star wars things so yeah you're gonna buy the millennium falcon when it comes out and everyone's gonna jump on there to to uh to try and buy it at once because what else are you doing so um and for them yeah. you know it's about focusing on their differentiator right they're a product company developing these awesome lego things and being creative and you know, running a data center, they said themselves is not their core differentiator. That's not what they needed to be focused on. So not only did this give them that, you know, the scalability they needed, but it helped them focus too. Well, I think it's interesting you talk about the, uh, you know, one of the things, things you talked about was, was um, running data, you know, running your own data center, right. Versus running things in cloud and what the overall impact on the environment is, you know, your social and environmental uh, uh, impact about running data. And so, you know, we talk about, you know, AWS is going to be, you know, completely, I think either, either carbon neutral or completely not, not carbon neutral, sorry, but completely sustainable um, uh, over the next, I think said few years. Um, I mean, I they invest so tremendously in their data center efficiencies, just out of oh, a matter gosh. of necessity and things like that. But it's really interesting when you tie that back into thinking of all the aspects here, you can actually see a direct correlation to things like optimizing your architecture and your applications for, you know, it looks like, cost optimization, but in the end, what you're actually really doing too, by adopting their platform and driving optimization in it's an environmental, it's an environmental responsibility, the ability oh, yeah. to reduce your impact. Oh yeah. It's, 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 it's power optimized. When you think about it's one of, some of the best practices when it comes to using containers, right? We call it bin packing or playing Tetris, right? Mm -hmm. You're trying to get as many of the containers on that one box as you can reasonably have and still maintain, um, you know, maintain resiliency. But, uh, but when you have, you know, that kind of density in there, it operates more fuel efficiently. Instead of spinning up, you know, 30 or 40 servers to run a workload, you can spin up three or four, right? right. Um, and that's, that's huge. Or spin down stuff that you're not using. Um, and then you can, uh, you know, you can be more choosy about what you spin up. You know, again, to, to beat a dead horse when it comes to the ARM-based processors, right? They run faster, they run cooler, and they run less expensively, less power consumption. Um, for the same performance. So you can cost optimize by using an ARM processor. You can power optimize by using an ARM processor and you still get more computing power out of them for most of your workloads. Um, so so, so making some, some recommendations along those lines and, and call yeah. outs, you know, it, there's a lot of things that are going to run just fine on ARM as is, but there's some things that will not. But the upfront investment and development is actually minuscule compared to the long-term operational impact and cost efficiencies. And you could even say environmental impacts by going and making yeah. some of those investments. And he was definitely a strong promoter of that today. Yeah. And I think that, I think it's important when we talk, that's again, when we talk about reinvention, it's changing the way maybe you do business or maybe changing the way that, that you have been, you know, writing software or that you've been deploying things on to, to something that's going to be a little bit newer, that's going to be more sustainable not just from a, uh, from a business standpoint, from an environmental, st environmental standpoint. And even the process of considering that is, is, a, is how businesses can make a difference and maybe a change in the way you do it before. Because if you've never once considered the environmental, the environmental impact of your software development practices or your infrastructure practices, maybe it's about time you do. Um, yeah. I think one of the other real big themes that he talked about was dependability. Definitely. That was huge, huge portion of it. And I think, it, 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 you know, when we talk about, um, you know, you going on the cloud in the first place, right? One of the main advantages folks have by being, you know, in a public cloud is to say, hey, I want to be able to have multiple instances. I want to have, be able to have in multiple availability zones. I want to be able to deploy here and here and here so I can have, you know, something be more dependable. But one of the, he really dove into what dependability is. Dependability is a business decision, Right how, what, what is a critical application? What is critical infrastructure? You know, has your business defined that? What can you say is, is an acceptable amount of downtime for that application, for that infrastructure, for you to say that it's dependable? And then how do you shoot for that, right? Um, and I think one of the things that they really talk about in order to find that is observability. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to have insight into your stack, into your infrastructure, into your software deployment, into your security practices, into all these little different uh, facets and aspects of your infrastructure in order to figure out, right, if you're doing the right things, if you have that uptime, if you have the, the service um, expectations that you're setting for your customers. Um, yeah, and I really enjoyed, the, you know, this whole session, but to me, when he got really into dependability, and as you mentioned, all the different aspects of de dependability he talked about, including security and all these things. Uh, I mean, to me, this was like classic cloud best practice. Oh, yeah. But what's, oh, yeah. 
What's really cool about it is all the investments that they're making into making cloud best practices easier. Just because we have said cloud best practices for years now doesn't mean it's always been easy to do it well. Oh, no, Things like no, the no. VPC reachability analyzer, the IAM analyzer, all these tools that they're rolling out there to actually help with security. Um, and I mean, let's talk about chaos engineering. That was a big, big topic today. <laughs> So that's, that's one that's near and dear to my heart as, as an operations and SRE focused person, like chaos engineering is something that, that has been um, making a big push in the industry, especially in the DevOps and the SRE world. Um, and seeing AWS now launch that as a, as a whole service right. uh, with the fault simulator, I think is, is, is fantastic. It really gives um, orgs a good chance to, to, Hey, let's see what happens when we throw a wrench in here. Uh, for real, and because a lot of times before, what is your what does your fault tolerance look like? Uh, we're going to take down this thing in a very predictable manner because we already know how to fix it, right? But at, when the pager goes off at three o'clock in the morning, it's never that. No, it's so, never. So, so it gives you a chance to really see what can happen and and how to how to architect around that. Whether it's, it's nice shout know, out to the the classic chaos monkey and uh, Netflix for helping pioneer the way in, in some ways oh, yeah. of chaos engineering, oh, yeah. but you know now making it accessible and readily available to to everybody coming soon in 2021. I'm really excited about that. But yeah. the, the thing that I also like that he called out, it's not just about identifying you know the the solution, the technical gaps in the environment. These simulations actually help them build really important operational muscles that you need to learn to develop to respond to incidents that you know. It's the classic, everything fails all the time. You should assume for everything. I mean, you can't really normally just plan for everything uh, very well, but when you start to make these things programmatic through tools like the AWS Fault Simulator, mm -hmm. I think that makes it a lot more of a reality. So the thing is that, that resilience is not a technical solution. Resilience is a cultural solution. Yeah. Your work culture has resilience. And when your work culture or your org or whatever it is has resilience as a value, it comes out in your infrastructure. It comes out in your software deployment. It comes out in what you write, right? Uh, and I think this this enables that is all it is. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about that was really awesome uh, was some of the things, was the announcement of the uh, managed servers for Grafana and Prometheus, right? Yes. Because exactly. like in order to know what dependability is, you have to be able to gather metrics on it, right? And you have to, and the, what you measure is what you're going to, is what you're going to do. So a lot of people have had sometimes issues scaling out Prometheus and Grafana to meet, you know, scaling out their observability to meet the size of their infrastructure. And the, the shortcut is always to let some stuff go, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we can't measure all these things for everything else. So we're going to measure these things. And without that, you don't have real observability. You don't know how dependable you are. You don't know, you know, if you're actually resilient. So having this as, as, a, as a managed service so that, so that you can scale out some of these endpoints and, and um, see the data and have it um, be readily available and have it be in an observable state. Like if you've never used Grafana before, it is such an amazing tool for visualizing some of this time series and metrics data that you have in your infrastructure. So super excited to see that you get a lot of control without a lot of the headache. It's, it's fantastic. Yeah, I think it's it's so common, especially for smaller companies that haven't been through the hyperscale growth cycles and things like that, to underestimate the complexity of good observability at scale. Um, he used examples of things like being able to just correlate timestamps with, you know, infrastructure-based metrics and things like that, and really the importance of having, you know, application-level logging. The logs matter, and these other services that really help to drive more observability into that full stack through the process. So, uh, really glad to see that. That's going to make things a lot easier at scale and and. I'm sure a lot of developers are really excited about that as well in operations teams. Yeah, I think another thing that's really that I really need to make sure that we talk about is that you know we talk about all the things that that go into making something dependable, that go into resiliency, um, and it's it's a lot, right? It's that's let's not just that you can flip a switch and do it, right? Um, and especially if you're one of those smaller companies that has not gone into hyperscale and you're experiencing those growth pains and your technical debt starting to rack up. Uh, that's where Michigan can come in and help you out with that, right? Because we have the insight and the expertise to be able to kind of unravel some of that, that yarn ball and figure out what we can do, what needs to be done, maybe uh, what needs to be reinvented and what you can salvage. Um, that way you can get a better, that way you can get a better grasp on what you can do, what your business is good at. And then you can build a product that, or build a product or build infrastructure that's going to be lucrative for you. Uh, I think the important part uh, about this is that when you go through the process of reinvention, um, it's never usually going to be easy because it was easy, anybody would do it, right? 
but we can help you bridge that gap, whether it's knowledge, whether it's training, whether it's hands-on, um, there's a lot of opportunities that we have to help you out on your path to reinvention. It's always exciting. Yeah, Tim, I, I would be remiss to try to wrap a better closing than that. I think you really just summed it up well. There's been so many amazing announcements and so many good best practices and things that have been shared throughout the session today and other sessions, but it's, it's a lot to take in. And without the right kinds of muscles and partners, uh, that's a really difficult thing to go and really take full advantage of and get the full value out of. So, uh, you know, there was so much more in this session that was covered today. I think I had 200 some odd lines worth of notes and I barely caught oh, yeah. it all myself. Um, but I really, I really enjoyed it. And, um, you know, I think this was a great one. So definitely uh, everybody, again, you know, make sure you check out some other videos if you're interested in, in seeing some of our other recaps. They're not recap, but reactions to some of these sessions and uh, expect more to come. And, uh, you know, reach out to Mission if there's any way we can help you. I think Tim just wrapped that up really well. We're here for you. We're, you know, these types of services, these launches make what we're able to provide our clients even more valuable. So I'm really excited about ramping up and getting familiar with more of these tools and having our teams do so and uh, being able to help everybody else take the full value of AWS and wrap it into their operations. Mm -hmm.